I wanted to be the best at whatever I did. And I wanted to be the best serial best. <laughs> I've probably done anything a man would want to do with a woman. Uh, obviously, I must be sick somehow. Uh, normal people don't do it. Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. So greatly appreciated. Truly, truly is. Before I get started, let me give you my usual disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next, if you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, with that. The infamous torso Richard Cottingham was, oddly enough, the very first video I've ever made, I've ever uploaded to YouTube. So the fact that literally a little over a year later, I'm back talking about him feels a little surreal. And... I, I just, I adore so many of you because so many of you have said that it was such a good video and it was, it was awful, <laughs> but I love you guys for that. I really, really do. So <clears throat> we are back talking about him again. For context, let's go back and highlight a few of the key points from this monster's reign of terror. He was born November 25th, 1946 in Bronx, New York. His father was an insurance agent and his mother was a housewife. And by all accounts, he had a fairly normal childhood. The family would relocate to Riverdale, New Jersey when Cottingham was 12 years old. After high school, he went to work with his father at Metropolitan Life Insurance Company as a computer operator. In 1966, at the age of 20, he would leave there to go to Blue Cross and Blue Shield to do this, the same work, different company. One year later, he would commit his very first when he... 29-year-old Nancy Vogel of Bridgefield, New Jersey. Nancy was a mother of two when she went missing. The last time anybody saw her, she was leaving her home in Little Ferry, New Jersey to go play bingo at her local church with a few of her girlfriends. For unknown reasons, Nancy decided not to go to bingo and decided to go shopping at Valley Fair Department Store instead. This would end up being a crucial mistake. While there, Cottingham approached her and took her to Ridgefield Park, where she would be found three days later, naked and in her own vehicle. She was severely beaten. On the right side of her face, she had a black eye and a large bruise on the side of her face. Her hands were tied in front of her with a thin cord and she was with a rope. She had a seat cover over her and her clothes were neatly folded on the back seat of her car. It would take Cottingham until 2010 to finally own up to this. In 1970, Cottingham married his then girlfriend Janet and the couple would go on to have three children together. October 10th, 1969, Richard Cottingham was arrested for a DWI while in New York. He would end up having to spend 10 days in jail and pay a $50 fine. He was arrested again in 1972 for shoplifting from Stern's department store in Paramus, New Jersey. Quick side note, I, I remember going to Stern's as a kid with my mother and my grandmother. I don't know why, it just, whatever. 
1973, he was charged with robbery, sodomy, and SA in New York City, but the case would end up getting dismissed. Of course. In February of 1974, he was charged with unlawful imprisonment and robbery in New York City. And again, the charges were dropped. From 1970 to 1974, Richard and Janet lived in the Ledgewood Terrace Apartments in Little Ferry, New Jersey. On October 15, 1973, the couple would welcome their first child, a little girl that they named Blair. In February of 1975, Richard, Janet, and Blair would leave and end up going to a home, a three-bedroom home on Vreeland Ave in Lodi, New Jersey. Just one month later, they welcomed their second child, a little boy that they named Scott. October 13th, 1976, the couple welcomed their final child, a little girl that they named Jenny. <sighs> July 17th, 1968, Cottingham, his second victim, a 13-year-old girl. If you want to skip ahead, you can. Uh, a 13-year-old girl named Jackie Harp. Jackie was last seen at 9 p.m. walking home from school after her all-girls band practice had wrapped for the evening. 30 minutes later, she was seen again five blocks away from her Birch Street home in Midland, New Jersey. Once midnight arrived and there was no sign of Jackie, her mother phoned police. She would end up being found the following morning, 25 paces from her house on a dead-end Morrow Road by a passerby. She had been punched in the face and with her flag sling. Even though Jackie was never R-worded, police do believe that the attack was sexually motivated. After his arrest, Cottingham would admit that Jackie was first spotted on Goodwin Ave, which was a Stewart's root beer at the time. And if you don't know, Stewart's root beer used to have little burger joints all around New Jersey. I'm sure other places as well. Um, and they were really nice. Like the girls would bring the food out to your car type deal. So that's what they're talking about. I've gone there. I used to go there. It's It was fun. Anyway, it's not important. Cottingham took her to a wooded field that is now the Cheshire Apartment Buildings. April 7th, 1968, just nine months after Jackie Harp, Cottingham would target his third victim, 18-year-old Irene Blaze. Irene lives with her mother in Bogota, New Jersey. She was last seen at the Hackensack bus terminal and was later found and floating in the Saddle River in Saddlebrook, New Jersey. July 14th, 1969, the body of 15-year-old Denise Velasca was found in Saddlebrook, New Jersey. She was to death with the chain of her crucifix necklace. August 9th, 1974, Cottingham would abduct and victims five and six, but he wouldn't be linked to them until just recently, as in like a year ago. Best friends, 17-year-old Marianne Pryor and 16-year-old Lorraine Kelly were last seen walking together on Broad Avenue in Ridgefield, New Jersey. The girls were trying to get to the Paramus Mall. And witnesses say that they saw the girls hitchhiking. And then some witnesses said that they saw the girls get into the vehicle of a white male that would very much later be identified as Richard Cottingham. The girls were reported missing when they failed to come home that night and their bodies would be found five days later. Both girls were R-worded, burned, and drowned. Side note, he kept them alive for five days. So they suffered. Those two girls suffered. They, they were kept alive in a hotel room. December 16th, 1977, the body of Cottingham's seventh victim, 26-year-old Marianne Carr, was found. 
Marianne was an x-ray technician who lived in the Ledgewood Apartments in Little Ferry, New Jersey. Yes, same apartments. She had been abducted shortly after returning home from work and was last seen in the parking lot of her apartment complex. She was brought to a Quality Inn motel on Route 17 in New Jersey. While inside, she was tied up and beaten before she was to death. After Cottingham was done with her, he dumped her behind the hotel. Just like throws them out like trash. Just, just throws them out like trash. It's, it's disgusting. When her body was found, she had marks on her neck, wrists, and ankles. She had imprints on her body and her autopsy results re revealed that her lungs had collapsed. March 22nd, 1978. It just never ends. Cottingham was hanging out and drinking at the 3rd Avenue Tavern in New York. It was there that he would notice 22-year-old Karen Schilt. She had just finished waiting tables at Tuesday's restaurant on 3rd Avenue. Cottingham approached her and introduced himself to her as John Schaefer. They hung out and had a few drinks together that night. Cottingham asked her if she was a working girl, to which she replied that she was not. And then after about an hour, Karen decided that she was tired and it was time to call it a night. So she began walking home to her apartment, which was at 94 3rd Avenue, and that was about a, under a mile away from where they were. While she's walking home, she begins to feel dizzy and she gets a suspicion that somebody had put something in her drink. It's at that point, Cottingham, or John Schaefer, appears and offers her a ride home. Like he's some white fuck knight or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's ridiculous. That just like came to save the day. You know, a break. Um, against her better judgment, though, she accepted the ride because of how sick she was feeling. Once he got her in the car, he took her out of Manhattan into New Jersey. During the ride, he offered her a pill to make her feel better. He gave her a barbiturate that suppresses the nervous system, and she accepted the pill, took it, and ended up passing out. He drove her to a parking lot across the street from the Ledgewood Terrace Apartments, and he essayed her. If you want to call it a blessing in disguise, thankfully, well, most importantly, she survived. Um, but she ended up being unconscious for the majority of the assault. So, I mean, obviously the living is most important. But, you know, the fact that she didn't, that she wasn't awake for it, I mean... And not that it makes it better, but I feel like maybe it makes it a little better. I don't know. I, she would later be found partially naked by a patrolman who calls the ambulance for her. But she's alive, and that's all that truly matters. She was taken to the Hackensack Hospital, where doctors confirmed that she had bruises on her legs, cigarette burns on her left breast, trauma to her elbow, scratch marks on both breasts, and bites on her chest. That's it. Because of all the pills he had given her, she was unable to recall many of the details, so her case would end up going cold until his arrest. There were no known victims in 1978, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any. You're going to see. More and more come out. So, maybe he just hasn't talked about them yet, but hopefully... Hopefully he does before he kicks the bucket. So he could give some families closure. Uh, it also doesn't mean, though, that he hung up his criminal hat for that year. During this time, Cottingham would commute back and forth to New York for work. While in New York, he would also stalk various bars in Manhattan and prey on innocent women. Once he picked a victim, he would slip something into their drinks, take them to a motel, and essay them for hours. In 1979, 
Cottingham's eighth victim was teenage was a teenage sex worker named Helen Sykes. He would cross paths with her in Times Square, New York. She would later be found severely mutilated, her legs severed, and dumped a flu- and dumped a few blocks away. Her was cut so badly that it nearly severed her. That's crazy. December 2nd, 1979. Cottingham's most disturbing crime to date. 22-year-old Didi Gudar- Gudarzi and a 16-year-old Jane Doe were both sex workers and they accompanied Cottingham to a hotel on West 42nd Street. It was here that the two women were butchered and set ablaze. After the fire was put out, first responders would find two twin beds with one body on each. Both bodies were missing their heads and hands. He took the heads and hands with him before setting the room on fire. The reason for this would have been to make it much harder for police to identify them. We know that. A lot of them do that. Now, I'm not 100% sure how far science had come at that point regarding fingerprints. But if that was his motive, he failed to realize that you can also be identified by your feet. Didi Gudarzi was a high-priced call girl whose family fled from Iran when she was just a child. Later on in life, she gave birth to a baby girl that was later named Jennifer. Sadly, she was forced to give her up for adoption just two weeks after her birth. Jennifer started to look for her birth mom at the age of 24 after she had been told that her mother was killed by a serial it would take her another 10 years to muster up the courage to write Cottingham. But when she did, it was simply because she needed answer to her questions. Did you know my mother? Did you murder my mother? And where's her head? Waiting in the window visit with a sheet of glass in between us. And although the image of him was a little frightening, I wasn't scared because he was behind a sheet of glass. But also I was more concerned with finding out about my mom. And that was the driving force. And I usually forget about everything else when it comes to finding out. Then in April of 2017, Cottingham responded to her in a three page letter. Part of the letter read, I just don't know what to say to you or how to say it. I can only tell you what's in my heart. and pray that you believe me. I am truly and deeply sorry, so very, very sorry. I'm sorry for the pain that I've brought into your life. I'm guessing he found God in prison the same way Chris Watts did. <laughs> but more importantly than that is the outrage that many people felt, mostly in my comment section, about the disbelief that she befriended the person that murdered, decapitated, and burned her mother. It's strange to say the least. I'm with you on that. But on the other hand, she claimed she did this as a ploy to find answers to her questions and maybe even bring some closure to other families. When she says it like that, I'm kind of like, Ugh. I'm very torn. I'll be honest. I'm very torn. In the end, it worked and Jennifer got her answer, some of her answers. Um, but you don't know how much of it is true. He told Jennifer that he was a client of Dee Dee's before that December night. He told Jennifer that he doesn't care about people or the... He told Jennifer that... He didn't care about people or the society around him. Selfishly, he was only concerned with himself and his needs. 
Well, he was honest about that. His goals were simple. He wanted to get over on people. He wanted to win. He wanted to cheat. He wanted to steal. He was honest there. His main concern was being able to thrash through, through every day and think that he was in charge of his own life. Okay. He tells Jennifer that her mother's head is buried at the base of the George Washington Bridge. Searches were done, but they have yet to find it. This is what I'm talking about, Jennifer. Don't trust him. Don't trust him. So is he really telling the truth? Is he mixing her up with somebody else? Or is he mixing them up with somebody else, I should say? Or is he just flat out lying to his new friend? Jennifer says that she was able to forgive Cottingham for his actions, become his friend, and has visit him, visited him well over 30 times with no plans to stop until every single question is answered. I doubt that if he was an active serial killer, I doubt I'd be friends with him. But because I'm trying to find information for the public, and I'm trying to find my mother's skull, and all these things are so sensitive. And what I'm doing, whether or not he's telling the truth or not, we are getting bits and pieces of the truth. I'm doing this for the mothers who lost their daughters. Do you, girl? I don't know if I could do that. Do you? May 5th, 1980. Police find the body of 19-year-old sex worker Valerie Ann Street. The teen would be found inside a hotel room of a quality in suites. She was handcuffed behind her back. She had been before being to death. Her body was covered in bite marks and bruises. She had adhesive tape over her mouth and she was placed under the bed for hotel staff to find. May 22nd, 1980. Cottingham picked up 18-year-old sex worker Leslie Ann Odell on the corner of Lexington and 25th. She agreed to sleep with Cottingham for $100 and was taken to the Hasbrook Heights Quality Inn, the same Quality Inn that he left Jennifer's body at two weeks prior for the maids to find, which they did. Okay. Once inside, he offers to give Leslie a massage, rolls her on her stomach, puts a knife to her, and a pair of handcuffs on her. He then proceeds to torture her so badly that he almost bit off one of her nipples. Thankfully, Leslie survived this ordeal and would later testify in court that Cottingham said to her, quote, you have to take it. The other girls did. You have to. Yuri, who needs to be punished. End quote. Cottingham made one crucial mistake that evening. And thank God he did. Because, a whole, because hotel staff were still so spooked about what had just happened to Valerie, they were on high alert. So after they heard Leslie's muffled screams... They demanded that Cottingham open the door. He was arrested and his reign of torture and terror was finally over. When they searched Cottingham, they found him with handcuffs, a leather gag, two slave collars, a switchblade, replica pistols, and a stockpile of prescription pills. He would later be charged with kidnapping, aggravated assault, attempted Aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Aggravated assault while armed. R word. Sodomy. Fellatio. Possession of a weapon. And possession of controlled substances. Okay. So, now that we're up to date, let's discuss why it's time to talk about Richard Cottingham again. This is Diane Kusick. In 1968, she was a 23-year-old mom living in New Hyde Park, New York. February 15, 1968, 
Diane went to the Green Anchors Mall to buy a pair of shoes. She was later found in the parking lot, deceased in her car. She was bound with duct tape and... <sighs> Police believe that while she was leaving the mall, Cottingham followed her out, pretended to be mall security, overpowered her, and abducted her. Because of advances in DNA, the Nassau County Police Department were able to finally close this 54-year-old cold case. Her daughter, Darlene, was only four years old when her mother was killed. And she's just another of the countless children that had to grow up without a mother because of Richard Cottingham's actions. A major break in a cold case on Long Island. Prosecutors have charged a notorious serial killer in the 1968 death of a young mother. 75-year-old Richard Cottingham has been in prison for decades and is serving a life sentence. As CBS 2's Jennifer McLogan reports, the new charges today were linked by DNA evidence. Emotions spilled over for the family of Diane Cusick, a cold case breakthrough after a chilling more than five decades ago, Richard Cottingham was arraigned in his hospital bed. No. I never thought I'd see this day. I had given up. But all these people got justice for me and for my mother. The year was 1968. Diane Cusick of New Hyde Park, a dance teacher, left her four-year-old daughter with her parents and drove to the Greenacres Mall to buy shoes and never came home. Her father found her blood body in the back seat of her car outside a steakhouse. Despite a half century of trying, the tragic case went unsolved. We believe this may be the oldest DNA hit to lead to a prosecution in the United States. It's already serving a life sentence. Can you plead guilty or not guilty? Can you please not guilty? It was very overwhelming. He just had like this dead stare. I felt like he was looking right at me. It was creepy. Arlene, we never got to meet your mother. But I can assure you, justice never runs out of breath, no matter how many years have gone by. Believing Cottingham. Diane's parents were part of the countless number of parents that had to live the rest of their lives without their baby girl because of Richard Cottingham's actions. Okay. Lorraine McGraw. Sonia McGraw, who is Lorraine's granddaughter, who, uh, who has developed a friendship of sorts with Cunningham, just like Jennifer, is speaking out and she's not happy about how police went about dealing with her grandmother's case. Before we get there, I think it's more important to discuss how Lorraine's death affected her daughter, who was only nine years old at the time, which in turn affected her granddaughter, Sonia. So Sonia, who's Lorraine's granddaughter, explains that her mother was so affected mentally, emotionally, and physically because of her mother's And because of the effect that it had on her mother, it affected the way that she was raised. And she explains that her, because of this, her childhood was very erratic and very heavy. Sonia says that her mother is traumatized from losing Lorraine. Lorraine, who was a sex worker at the time, according to news outlets, and was a dancer, according to her granddaughter, was found on what was called Lover's Lane at the time, near a water tower in Nyack, New York. I am the granddaughter of Lorraine Montalvo McGraw. She is a cold case victim. Um, by Mr. Richard Cottingham. There was an anonymous tip um, from back when her murder was first released in which she may have been uh, dancing at one of the local bars and clubs along Route 9W. Um, there is record of her having a cabaret license which Confirm that she can do go-go dancing legally uh, in a bar or club. And so that possibly, that tip 
may may match um, that she was working up here. Uh, however, Richard explained to me that he had seen my grandmother multiple times, not just the one night that he may have. The truth of the matter is that regardless of what her means of income were, she didn't deserve this. Nobody deserves this, and her family didn't deserve this either. Sonia spent a significant amount of time befriending Cottingham, and she is furious that police got the confession from Cottingham without her being present. She claims that she was promised a face-to-face -face confession and believes that police robbed her of that right. Police see it differently. I am unhappy with the way uh, Richard Cottingham's confession was taken and accepted by the Rockland County Police and the District Attorney's Office. They knew that me and Richard had developed a type of relationship in which we wanted to be face to face when he explained to me how he knew my grandmother and what happened to her. Um, we had made several attempts to make that happen and before I can get a chance for that to happen, uh, the police went ahead and made a visit to him in which he was unaware for the cause of the visit. And so in, in his descriptions to them during that time, he said some things and the police took that information and basically ran with it. In order to close, in order to close my grandmother's case, Sonia Ruiz McGraw, who lost her grandmother to the killer, said she also established a rapport with Cottingham by sending him photos of herself with her Doberman Pinscher. Richard happens to actually really love animals, um, and they sound fantastic. Um, but I think it's definitely something that helps the victim's granddaughter said Rockland County investigators promised she could hear Cottingham's confession in person. But a police source asked us, quote, what legitimate law enforcement agency ever allows a victim's family member to sit in on a confession? It's just not done. Monday, October 6th, 1974, 15-year-old Nanuet High School teen Lisa Thomas arrives home from school at 2.15 p.m. After helping her mother with some chores around the house, she asked her mother, Barbara, for permission to go to the Nanuet Mall, which was only like a little less than a mile away from her home so that she could buy a shirt. Lisa grabbed her purse and promised her mother that she would be home before dinner. After she leaves the house, she takes the same route that she's taken hundreds of times that's right by her house that is through a wooded area. Okay? I imagine that. Because this route was right by her house and because she's taken this route countless times before... Lisa felt very comfortable and very safe traveling it. I also imagine that if this was a different wooded area or if she had not traveled it before and it was not located near her home, that she may have thought twice before traveling down it. When Lisa failed to return home in time for dinner, her mother grew very concerned. She was a responsible teen and if she was going to be late, she would have phoned. She tried to tell herself that Lisa had just run into a few friends and she lost track of time and there's no need to worry. After the family's finished with dinner and there's still no Lisa, her father, Stanley, grows very concerned and heads over to the mall to find his daughter. An unsuccessful Stanley returns home. And they waited for Lisa to walk through that door, probably sitting there talking about how much trouble she was going to be in, how long they were going to ground her for, what privileges they were going to take away from her so that they would ensure that she would never make this mistake again. But Lisa never walked through that door and Barbara and Stanley never got the chance to scream at her for making them worry and then hug her and cry because they're just so happy that she's home and she's alive and that's all that really matters. At 10.30 p.m., Lisa's parents called the Clarkstown Police Department to report her missing. Police told the parents that because the mall was already closed for the evening, there was little that they could do in terms of finding out if she had ever made it to the mall. But 
they were convinced that she was just another teenage runaway, which they always are, which is one of my biggest pet peeves in the world. I have such an issue with this. I, I do. I have the biggest issue in the world with this because I have a strong belief that every single missing person should be treated as an abduction until there's proof that they are not. How do you pick and choose which cases are high priority, which people are a high priority and which ones are just runaways? It's bullshit. It's complete bullshit to me. You don't know. They just assume it's a teenager. So she must be, she must be a runaway. You know how many times are wrong about that? Yeah. If this was a, a cop's child, <clears throat> I don't even want to go there, but I'm going to go there. <laughs> if this was a cop's child, every officer in town would be out looking for their brother's child, the brother in blue's child. No disrespect to police officers. I actually have, I actually, you know, I don't mind police officers, most of them. So what makes anybody else's child different? That's what I want to know. Sorry. Sorry for that rant. It just gets under my skin. Every time I hear that, it's probably, oh, they're probably a runaway. Stanley, who was a construction worker, began to get extremely worried the next morning when Lisa was still not home. So he got up and he went to look for his baby. This time, several police officers joined him to search for Lisa, and they would end up stumbling across her lifeless body 75 yards away from the mall parking lot in a field. She'd been blindfolded with a red handkerchief that she kept around her purse, her purse was, and her purse was found several yards away from her. She was completely clothed except for her white sweater that was wrapped around her. Her white shoes were still white and there was very little blood found. And detectives have always said that Cottingham's crime scenes are very neat. They're very neat. They're very pristine. There's rarely ever blood around. There's no fingerprints. I mean, the one, he folds the clothes and puts them neatly to the side. Who does that? He does. He folds the victim's clothes and puts them neatly to the side. They first believe that she was to death until the medical examiner confirmed that she had been bludgeoned. She was struck several times with a hard object on the bridge of her nose, the top of her head, and behind her left ear. Her skull was fractured in several places and she had massive internal bleeding. The theory of a robbery was shut down pretty quickly when Lisa was found with about $2 in cash and her mother said that she left the home with 15 bucks. Family also said that Lisa would have given them anything that they wanted and, and who wouldn't really? In truth, if it's your life or it's a couple bucks, you're going to hand over the money to they leave you the hell alone. Plus, it's quite unlikely that a robbery would have ended like this. The medical examiner stated that Lisa died somewhere between the window of 4 and 6 p.m. and that she never made it to the mall. Officers performed the customary routine of speaking to Lisa's family and friends, teachers and classmates, and all leads came up empty. People described Lisa as a very sweet, very popular sophomore that was a star athlete and loved by all. About two weeks before her death, Lisa began dating a 17-year-old boy named Gary. He told officers that she was an extremely sweet girl with zero enemies. Lisa's mother sought answers up until the day she died and she sadly never got them. She was convinced that Lisa was by people that she knew and that this was no random stranger attack. So why are we talking about Lisa Thomas in a Richard Cottingham video, right? Okay. I have answers. Lisa's case is still very much a cold case. Okay. Cottingham sent an email to a man named Peter Vronsky, who has a doctorate in history and considers himself a forensic historian. 
The email was sent on February 27, 2022 at 7.23 a.m. And it reads, Peter, I need your sleuthing ability. An old case may have come into memory, or it's just a figment of my imagination. I believe this one occurred either 1972, 3, or 4. It would have occurred within visual distance of a mall, either in Suffern or Nyack, New York. She was a white girl in her teens. She may have been coming from the mall. Now, I may be mixing her up with Lisa because I see long curly hair, but darker than blonde hair. I kind of remember her putting up a good fight, which surprised me. And because of that, she didn't get her. And because of that, we didn't get around to having sex. She wasn't a hooker and it happened during the day, probably late morning. So the issue with this is that. Although he could be telling the truth, he could be. He's only given information that is public knowledge. He never gave any details that only the killer would know. So that's why family and friends of Lisa are having a hard time. And actually, and officers also, they're all having a hard time believing that he's responsible for this. But more importantly, they do not want Cottingham to take the rap for something that he didn't do. Not because they want to protect him. Because they don't want the person who's actually responsible for it to potentially never be charged. And I, I couldn't agree with them more. Because at this point, I mean, come on. The guy's, he's going to croak any day. You know, he's going to croak soon. I'm just saying. He's going to die soon. What does he care? He's got so many charges against him. What's one more? You know, like, so I get them. No. Then what? The real person walks with it with never getting charged? I'm with them 100%. 100% I'm with them on this. So what are your thoughts on Lisa Thomas? What are your thoughts on Richard Cottingham? What are your thoughts on Jennifer Weiss? There were all, she was a hot topic in my comment section on the first video. So I really want to know what you guys are thinking about her. One more thing before we go. I was thinking, what if we started like a new series to this channel where you send me story times about your experiences, family's experiences, friends' experiences. It doesn't have to be all dark. It could be anything. It could be, you know, my encounter with the, the a dumb crook, uh, my crazy ex, my, I don't know, I, I live next door to a serial killer, I, whatever. It could be lighthearted. It could be heavy if you want, you know, whatever. You could send it to me anonymously. You can say I want my name. You know, you can tell me you want your name. It doesn't matter. I just want thoughts first. And like, would you guys be into something like that where you would send me, you know, your story with a bunch of background information and then I would kind of tell you the story as a story time, either anonymously or, you know, or you could be identified completely up to you. But I wanted to see who would be into something like that. Let me know in the comment section down below. Now with that, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you so very much. If you have any suggestions, email me, harding527 at yahoo.com. If you are totally into the story time bit and you have a story time, email me your story time. And I'll get started on it. Uh, let me know answer to my questions in the comments below. I read your comments. I want to know what you guys are thinking. And until next time, stay safe out there, guys.